Good morning, Moses Lake Christian Church. My name is Phil Payne, and I'm one of the teaching pastors here on staff. And it is so great to be with you on the first Sunday of Advent. Yeah, I don't know if you realize that or not, but this morning as we gather today, the 29th of November, it's the first Sunday of Advent. And Pastor John and I are going to take the next four weeks and, and talk about how do we prepare well for the coming of Jesus. Well, we all know it's out there. We know it's marked on our calendars. And, and in our calendars today, it's the 25th of December, right? That's Christmas morning. We celebrate the birth of Jesus. But more than just one day, we really want to take some time to talk about preparation. You see, that's really what Advent is. Now, Advent signifies the coming of Christ into the world. It has an idea of, of, of something that, that is we're anticipating, we're expecting, we're excited about. Have you ever been there personally in your life, excited about something in the future? I remember a few years ago, my wife and I had the opportunity to go to Hawaii for two weeks. Our kids gave us a gift marking one of our significant anniversaries, and, and we knew it was out there in front of us. And we were so excited. And we got our bags ready and our clothes ready, but more than just our things, we got our hearts ready. We got our lives ready, and we look forward to that a couple months from now, and then one month from now, and then a couple of weeks from now, and then the day came that we're going tomorrow. That's the idea of Advent, to get excited about and prepare yourself for a coming event. Maybe it was when you got married. You think about that, you were so excited to get married, and you prepared for it, and finally the day came and you were ready. Maybe it was the birth of a child. That the, the pregnancy took you know, nine months and we look forward to that. And then the day comes and we are expectingly hoping, excited for what's going to take place. That's the idea of Advent. But you know what? It, it, it takes some work to do that. It takes some anticipation and a little bit of, of work in our hearts and our lives and creating some space, in fact. You know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this. The celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect, and who look forward to something greater to come. Now, you know, I got to be honest, I, I'm, I'm not excited about being poor and imperfect. In fact, a lot of times we kind of look at our lives and think, well, we, we've kind of got things together. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer made a great point here. That if my life is so full and I'm so content with what I have now, there's very little room for what I expect in the future. There's very little room for being excited about Jesus coming. Jesus just becomes another ho-hum part of my life. And so I, I want to admit that I'm poor and imperfect. I want to look at my life and look forward to something greater to come, and that is Jesus. As we think about Advent, there's so much we can share out of God's Word. I, I want to just take you to a, a quick story Jesus told in Matthew chapter 25. It, it kind of captures the, the idea and story behind Advent of that expectantly waiting for Christ. And Jesus talked a lot about the kingdom of God. And in Matthew chapter 25, we, we find a passage. And, and if you look at your Bible, you see that the, the story in there is called the parable of the ten virgins. And that can sidetrack us pretty quick, right? We look at that and go, oh, that's kind of weird. I, I don't really get that. But it's really a, a pretty simple story about a couple getting married and, and what happens leading up to that wedding. You see, we got to understand a little bit about Jewish weddings. There were three parts to a Jewish wedding. Not all that uncommon to what we have today. The, the first part of, of a Jewish wedding was the engagement. There was a formal agreement made by the fathers of the bride and the groom. And then the second part of, of a Jewish wedding, there was a, a period of betrothal. And during that betrothal, that, that's really where, where mutual promises are made from the bride and the groom and the families and, and the preparation. And then the third part was the actual marriage ceremony itself. It, it usually took about a year 
when the bridegroom would come at an unexpected time for his bride. The groom would show up at the bride's house unannounced. And, and really, it was the bridal party. It was the, the group of people that the, the, the bride had chosen to be on the lookout, to be watching for the groom to come. In this particular story, there's 10 of them. There's 10 in the bridal party, and their job was to be looking for the groom. And when they saw him, they would go out to meet the groom, and they would usher him into the house to meet the bride and to have the marriage that they'd been so excited about, looking forward to. And so Matthew 25, with that little bit of background, here's the story Jesus tells. Jesus says this, At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but they did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and they fell asleep. And at midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And then all the virgins woke up and they trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, hey, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. And then the key verse, Matthew 25, 13, Jesus says this, Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Now, Jesus is talking about a couple different times where he is going to arrive. He's ultimately talking here about when he returns to earth to take his church to eternity, to those who know Jesus as our Savior and Lord. But he's also talking about the daily reality of being ready for Jesus, ready to show up. And as we think about this holiday season, we think about the Advent season, I want to remind you that the church is called the bride of Christ. We are waiting for Jesus, absolutely waiting for his return. But more than just his eventual return, we're waiting every day for him to show up in our lives, in our relationships, in our job, in our family. The season of Advent is that we are anticipating Jesus and we are preparing our hearts. And Christmas gives us a really awesome time as individuals and as families, to remember his birth, to remember his life, his death, and his resurrection. And to ask ourselves that question in the midst of Advent, am I ready? Am I living every day ready for Jesus to, yes, someday return and take me to eternity, but am I ready today? Am I ready for him to show up in my life and for me to live every moment giving him honor and glory? And seeing his impact in my life and his impact through my life. Am I ready for the kingdom of God? Am I like those wise part, people in the bridal party who had their lamps ready and had their oil ready? They, they weren't distracted. Or am I like the foolish? Who really a lot of things were going on. The, the bridegroom was long in coming, the passage says. And they ran out of oil. They hadn't bought enough. They got distracted. And the most crucial moment came along when the bridegroom showed up and they weren't ready. I don't know about you, but I want to be like the wise virgins. I don't want to be like the foolish ones. I want to be ready every day for Jesus to show up in my life. I want to be ready when Jesus calls. I want to be ready when Jesus says, hey, now's the moment that I'm at work in your life, in your marriage, in your family, in your relationships, in your job. Jesus, I want to be found ready. But I also realize in the midst of our culture and our life, this is really challenging. In the midst of a busy season where we've seen a pandemic and we've seen all kinds of conflict and in the midst of a challenging election, not to mention this time of year, all the preparation and the shopping and the lights and, and all the pressures that our culture puts on us or sometimes the pressures we put on ourselves. That it's easy to get distracted 
It's easy to not be ready. It's easy to miss the moments when Jesus shows up and wants to show up. And so today, just for a few moments, I want to have a conversation with you of, of the idea of Advent, of expectingly being ready. How do we do that? And hopefully, we, I want to give you a really practical tool today. And that practical tool is found in Psalm 113. So if you've got a Bible with you, I want you to open it to Psalm chapter 113. And it's just a really short psalm. There's a really, really great practical tips in here of how we can be ready and prepared during this Advent season. For the coming of Jesus. Psalm 113, that's where I want you to go. And let me read Psalm 113 for us. Psalm 113 says this, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. He sits, sets them with princes. He seats them with princes, excuse me, with the princes of his people. He settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, it's not hard to figure out the theme of this, this psalm. It's not even hard to figure out the really practical tool that I'm going to give you today right from Scripture of how we can prepare our hearts and be ready. It's the idea of praise. In fact, right here in this psalm, the theme of the psalm, praising the Lord, is mentioned six times in nine short verses. Who should praise the Lord? It says in the very first verse, his servant should. When, when should we praise the Lord? Both now and forevermore, verse 2 says. Where do we praise the Lord? Well, verse 3 really says everywhere. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun. Where does it rise? Where does it set? Well, you and I know that that's perpetual. It's all around our earth. The, the, the sun, even as it's setting for us, is rising for other groups of people. And so really his servant should be praising now and forevermore. Everywhere it's appropriate to praise the Lord. Why do we praise the Lord? Well, verse 4 says because he is exalted above the nations. He is exalted above the nations. His glory above the heavens. He is without equal, verse 5 says. You see, when we look at God, we realize that he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is eternal. He is immortal. He is invincible. There is no one greater than our God. He is so worthy of our praise. But the psalmist continues that not only is he worthy of our praise because he's exalted, because he's high above the nations, he's, his glory is above the heavens. But one of the greatest reasons we praise God is because he's not distant. No, that same God who is immortal, invincible, enthroned above the heavens He's the God who comes near. He is the God who incarnationally showed up here on earth. And Mary and Joseph were to call his name Emmanuel, God with us. The psalmist says he looks on the heaven and the earth. It reminds me of 2 Chronicles, where the writer of 2 Chronicles says that the eyes of the Lord are roaming throughout the earth, looking for hearts who belong to him so that he may strengthen them. Psalm 113 says he looks on the heaven and the earth. He stoops down. He raises the poor from the dust and the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. He settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. You know, that's exactly what he has done with us. He has taken us, made from the dust, if you remember Genesis chapter 1. God breathed life into dust and created man. He has taken us from the dust. He has taken us from the ash, heap is, ash heaps of our sin. Romans 3 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, Christ died for us. This same God who is enthroned in the heavens, whose glory is above all other things, he is an incarnational God. He is one who has stepped into creation 
the coming of Jesus, the birth of Jesus. So we celebrated Christmas. He came and he came to give life. He came to raise us out of the dust and out of the ash heap and to set us with princes that we are in Christ called his children. We are the children of God. Think about what the transformation that has happened in your life. Think about the transformation that's happened in our lives, both physically and spiritually. God is the one who redeems us, who gives us purpose and direction in our lives. He is the one to be praised. You see, thinking about praise, praise is one of those things that absolutely changes our lives. Praise, if we will commit to it, is something that will get us ready for Advent. I want to give you a couple of things to think about. Because really, we are asking that question, how, how do we stay ready? How do we prepare for this season? How do we stay focused on God in the midst of a, of a busy and a full life? Well, the answer and the key is found right in this psalm that we are to regularly and habitually and as a part of our lives, praise the Lord. Why would we do that? Let me give you a couple things to think about. First of all, praise. Praise gets our focus off of ourselves and back onto God. Man, it is so easy in our selfie generation and our selfie focused world to make it all about us, isn't it? We need this constant reminder we may know that in our heads, but yet in our hearts, so often we think about ourselves. We're prone to selfishness. And God desires that our eyes would be set firmly on him because that's where our true hope is found. He is worthy of our praise, no matter what we face day to day. In the great moments of the day and the really hard moments of our day, God is worthy of praise. The psalmist later on in Psalm 150 would say this, Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his ex excellent greatness. You see, the first reason I would challenge us today to praise the Lord is it gets the focus off of ourselves and back onto God. Oh, we need that during this Advent season to put our focus squarely on God who is worthy of honor and glory. The second thing is here, really praise brings us to a place of humility. We remember our dependency on God. And we acknowledge our need for him. None of us set out to be wholly independent of God, but it's so easy to get there. To think that I can prepare everything that I need for myself. I can provide everything I need for myself. And God says, no, come back to me. Make space in your heart and your life for me. And so not only does praise get the focus off of ourselves, but praise brings us to a place of humility. As we praise him as creator and king of this world, we admit and we recognize that we're not in control. He is. Oh, if there's ever a time to be reminded that we're not in control, now's it, isn't it? When we praise God, we acknowledge he is above all. He is sit seating in the heavens, enthroned his glory above all else. God, we need that. We need to remember that. To get the focus off of ourselves, to bring ourselves to a place of humility. You know, praise also makes the enemy flee. When we praise God, that pushes back the darkness of evil that surrounds us. And it blocks the attack and the lies of the enemy. Evil will not stick around when we're praising our God. He is the one who fights battles for us. There's a great story in the Old Testament in 2 Chronicles 20 of a guy named Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat, God called to step out with his armies and to battle for God. But God told Jehoshaphat something really important. Hey, in the front of the army, the front of the warriors, I want you to put a choir there. I want the front of the army, the front of the attack to be people praising my name. And as Jehoshaphat was obedient to God, as he put the, the people praising God out front, it brought victory to the entire army. Oh, how often sometimes we think that we can go out in battle by ourselves and we end up losing and falling flat on our face. Praise makes the enemy flee because God is in the midst of that. We need to get the focus off of ourselves. We need to bring ourselves back to a place of humility. Praise makes the enemy flee. 
Praise leaves no room for complaining and negativity. Oh, again, it's so easy in our culture today. And looking forward to the Christmas season, the Advent season, to just be so full of negativity and complaining. We don't like this and we don't like that. And this place is too crowded or I don't have enough time or I'm disappointed with what's happening around me. And we can become so negative and so full of complaining. Sometimes even within our prayers, we, we can tend to complain about our problems. But God knows our hearts and he cares about that and all that's concerning us. But through praise, we're focused on him, no longer allowing too much attention to be centered solely on my struggles. We're reminded of what he has already done in our lives. We're reminded that he knows what concerns us and he is capable of taking care of the burdens. How's the level of negativity in your life? How's the level of negativity in my life? How are we doing complaining? You know, praise leaves no room for complaining and negativity. It's not about sticking your head in the sand and pretending. No, that's not what God says. God says, bring that to me. And as we do that with praise, we push out the complaining, we push out the negativity, and we anticipate with hope all that Jesus wants to do in us and through us. Again, Psalm 103 says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He is the one who forgives all your iniquity, heals all your diseases, redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Man, God is worthy of praise. Praise paves the way for God's power to be displayed and miracles to happen. When we choose to praise God, we are literally putting God on display. We are paving the way for his power to step into our lives. I love the story in Acts chapter 16 of Paul and Silas, right? You remember that story? They, they've been out preaching. They've been out obedient. And pretty soon they're thrown in prison. They're flogged. They're beaten for the sake of the gospel. And they could have done a lot of things. They, they could have turned to each other and complained and, and, and moped and whined. They, they could have compared their wounds. They, they could have done a lot of things. They could have gotten silent and withdrawn. But you know what? In Acts chapter 16, it says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. As Paul and Silas were praying, they were praising, they were putting God on display. And suddenly, Acts 16 says, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were loosed. A miracle took place that day because Paul and Silas chose to praise God, to praise him. How are you and I doing of putting God on display? You see, as we think about the Advent season, as we prepare our hearts and our lives for the coming of Jesus, yes, his birth, and yes, his life, and yes, his death, and yes, his resurrection, and yes, his second coming, but also preparing our hearts and our lives to put him on display every single day. Praise gets the focus off of ourselves. Praise brings us back to a place of humility. Praise leaves no room for complaining and negativity. Praise paves the way for God's power to be displayed and for miracles to take place. A couple of questions for you and I to consider. How common is praising the Lord for you? Not just sitting in church, not just in times like this where, where really we look and we go, Man, I'm not sure how to do that. How creative are you and I? How what opportunities are we taking to lift up our voices in song, to lift up our voices in prayer, to praise God for his creation, to look around for who he is and all that he has done. How common is praising the Lord for you? How can you daily practice praise? How can you incorporate praise of God into your family this Advent season? What an awesome thing for you as a family to spend time praising God for who he is and for all that he has done. And then how will the practice of praise keep you focused on Jesus? You see, that's where we want to be, right? We want to be focused on Jesus during this Advent season. He is exalted. He is wonderful and majestic. He is without equal. He is powerful. He is holy. He is eternal. He is sovereign. He is infinite. 
He is holy, pure, blameless. He is the sacrifice for our sins. He is the one who brings us into his family. When we praise him, we remember all that he's done, how he's involved, how he's provided for you, how he's raised you up out of the dust and the ash heap, how he's given you identity and purpose, how he has provided for you and for me over and over and over again. He is so worthy of our praise. And so this week, my prayer for you, my prayer for me is that praise would be what helps us get ready for the Advent season. That praise is what helps us to welcome Jesus into our lives. That praise would be that that helps us focus on Jesus during the season of Advent. And praise would be what keeps our focus there. Not just momentary, but a lifestyle. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised. Both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the setting of its place. The name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations. The glory, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? The one who is enthroned on high who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. He settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. May that be true of your life and my life this week as we look forward in Advent to the coming of Jesus in our hearts, and our lives, and our families. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm.